Hello and welcome to The World Today on Channels Television. I'm Cynthia Are. Here are our top stories. Now, barely 24 hours after the Islamic State militants released a video showing yet another beheading of another U.S. journalist, Stephen Stotloff, the President, Barack Obama, has vowed the U.S. will not be intimidated. You will recall that about two weeks ago, journalist James Foley was similarly killed. Separately, the U.K. held a meeting of its emergency COBRA committee after threats to kill a British hostage who was shown in the latest video. To please release my child. As a mother, I ask your justice to be merciful and not punish my son for matters he has no control over. I ask you to use your authority to spare his life. Obama. A mother pleading for the life of her son to be spared. But clearly, that plea fell on deaf ears. Addressing U.S. President Barack Obama, these, according to Islamic State's latest video, are his last words. ...of intervention in Iraq was supposed to be for the preservation of American lives and interests. So why is it that I'm having to pay the price of your interference with my life? The video then purports to show subtlest beheading and another message for the White House. You, Obama, have yet again, through your actions, killed yet another American citizen. So just as your missiles continue to strike our people, our knife will continue to strike the necks of your people. But President Obama remains unshaken and promises justice for the families of the victims. I want to say that today the prayers of the American people are with the family of a devoted and courageous journalist, Stephen Sotloff. Whatever these murderers think they'll achieve by killing innocent Americans like Stephen, uh, they have already failed. They failed because, like people around the world, Americans are repulsed by their barbarism. We will not be intimidated. And their horrific acts only unite us as a country and stiffen our resolve to take the fight against these terrorists. Sotlov, a freelance journalist, was kidnapped in Syria in August 2013. His mother Shirley appealed on August the 27th in a videotaped message to Islamic State's self-proclaimed Caliph Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi for her son's release. That video was issued after the United States resumed airstrikes in Iraq in August for the first time since the end of the U.S. occupation in 2011. Now, as the NATO summit is about to take place, Russian President Vladimir Putin is hopeful for a peace agreement to be reached between Ukraine and pro-Russian rebels by Friday. Mr. Putin urged both sides to stop military action in eastern Ukraine, adding that his views and those of his Ukrainian counterparts were very close. Ukraine President Petro Poroshenko says he, they, that they had agreed a ceasefire process. And meanwhile, the U.S. President Barack Obama says the NATO agreed or guarantee the independence of its members in the Baltic states. He also told his audience of U.S. and Estonian military that their countries were stronger because they were democracies, but that their vision was threatened by Russia's aggression against Ukraine. He also said that they were provable facts that Russian combat forces were on the ground in Ukraine. He added that NATO had to send UN an, or an unmistakable message in support of Ukraine this week, as well as strengthening the defenses of two other former Soviet republics, that's Moldova and Georgia. A NATO summit opens in Wales tomorrow, and it's expected to back plans for a rapid response force and bolster the alliance's presence in Eastern Europe. Now, it's another day in yet another case of mistaken identity. Two U.S. men who spent three decades in prison for rape and murder, one of whom was on death row, have been released after DNA evidence proved their innocence. Mentally disabled half-brothers, Henry McCollum, who was 50 years old, and Leon Brown, who's 46, were convicted in 1984 of raping and killing 11 year old, an 11-year-old girl in North Carolina. Recently analyzed DNA evidence from the crime scene implicated another man who is in prison for a similar crime. A county judge ordered the immediate release of the brothers, and Tuesday's court judgment followed an investigation by the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission, which tested DNA evidence found at the scene. 
The commission found that none could be traced to Mr. McCollum or Mr. Brown. Now to discuss the issue of that case of no mistaken identity, I'm being joined now in the studio by Mr. Coyote Williams. He is the head of the Prison Rehabilitation Mission International. Thank you so much for joining us on The World Today. Yeah, nice meeting you. Thank you very much. Now, one can't help but ask, you know, if this case of another mistaken identity, you were here with us a while ago, now we have another case of mistaken identity, does it have to do with something concerning the color of their skin, especially since there was no evidence to place them at the murder scene at the time which it took place? Yes, it's possible because uh, this racism issue and uh, uh, hatred for people of other colors uh, always affect such investigation because there is no base, basis for prosecuting them without sufficient evidence. And you kept them for 30 years. So it's possible that uh, uh, only for the color, but hatred for people that are not really of their origin. Now, they also confessed after five hours of intense questioning or interrogation, if that's a relative you know, um, instance. But what, what is um, interesting in this case is that there was no lawyer present or even family member during the time of this questioning, and they confessed to the incident. What does that say about the legal they system? They must have undergone torture. They might have been humiliated. They might have been forced you know, when you are under serious torture, and these people know how to really make you to come out, to say yes, when you are not even the, 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 the real actor that committed the offense. But because the way they we torture them into confessing, that also is another significant thing that makes them to come out and confess. What about the fact that there was no lawyer present there? Uh, what does that say about the legal that system? That is part of the racism. They, they, it's, 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 it's orchestrated. It's a strategy. They know what they are doing. Because if it is a person of the other color, there will be a lawyer. But for, for them, they want to prove that, okay, and they don't know that at the end of the day, the, 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 the truth will still rise and shine. So the truth is coming out now. Now, one, one, um, what makes this case particularly sad is that these men were already intellectually disabled. What I'd like to ask you, since based on what you do, you've had a chance to interact with you know, prisoners and all that, based on, on their mental state at the time, how do you think they were affected by you know, being in prison for what they didn't do and now that they've been released? How do you think it's going to affect their psychology? It has affected them psychologically, physically, spiritually because they have been dehumanized for 30 years. They, they, they are spiritually disabled, they are physically disabled, not because they, 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 they lost any part of their body, but because they cannot think straight. For an offense you did not commit, and for somebody to be incarcerated, humiliated, the traumatic experience of prison must have taken a lot out of their life. Is there any form of compensation you think that would ever be enough for this kind of This has situation? been the problem. Nobody look at the angle of compensating people like this. These are not the first people. All they will say, they are discharged and acquitted now, and they are released, and uh, they should go and uh, uh, forgive and forget. But if they release them, who is following them up to reintegrate them back into the society, to, 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 to rehabilitate them, and then reset to them. So the compensation is not just one area. Because so many things must have happened. For all the years spent in the prison, these are teenagers when they enter there. <laughs> they might have been harassed by hardened criminals who might have even lured them into homosexuality. So many things, on the, we are only seeing the physical ones. Mm. But there are some things down that are not physical that we can see. And this will be torturing them throughout the days of their life. Because nobody is making any provision for compensation. And why? Why? 
this is not the first case, not only over there. You see, it has, I told you some time ago yes. that it happens here even in Nigeria. A young man was sentenced to death and finally hanged to death. And after, the, after he was hanged, then came the, 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 the appeal came out and he was discharged and acquitted. But he's late because he's dead already. And nobody compensated the family. Nobody wanted to know anything about him again. So the same thing is happening now. Internationally, human rights activists and people that have the make of kindness should raise up and come up for these people. They should be properly rehabilitated. They should be properly reintegrated back into the society. They should be properly resettled. They are now adults. Those who are of their age mate, by the time they left, you know what they have done academically on other areas of life. So they needed to be compensated seriously. It should be looked into. Well said. Thank you so much. I've been speaking with uh, Mr. Kayode Williams. He is the director of the Prison Rehabilitation Mission International, and he's been telling us about the case of mistaken identity concerning two men who were wrongfully placed in prison for about 30 years. We'll take a break now in the world today, and when we come back, we'll give you an update on the Ebola virus. Please stay with us. If you want to know what's trending or you miss your favorite live shows, you can watch it all on our YouTube channel. Simply log on to www.youtube.com forward slash channels web. Scroll down to your favorite program and click play. You can also view all uploaded videos by clicking on view all. Don't forget to subscribe and get the latest videos. If they are interesting, like them and be heard. Get connected with the channel's television YouTube page. The news at your fingertips. Welcome back. You're still watching The World Today on Channels Television. Now, earlier on, we told you about the NATO summit, which is about to take place tomorrow and the Russian president Vladimir Putin is hopeful for a peace agreement to be reached between Ukraine and pro-Russian rebels by Friday. Now for more on this as well as the IS threat I'm being joined live from Cardiff by the Voice of America's Al Pesson. Al thank you so much for joining us on The World Today. Now the summit opens in Wales tomorrow. Could you give us an idea of how the preparations are so far? Well, there's certainly a lot of security around here where I am in Cardiff. And uh, as you approach the conference center, it's, it's a beautiful golf resort. And uh, there are a lot of police. And we even saw a couple of NATO fighter jets circling overhead. So they certainly seem to be getting ready for 28 leaders and many, many other officials uh, who are arriving today for two days of talks. Now, how do you reckon the issues on the agenda will be addressed concerning the crisis in Ukraine? as well as that of the IS? Well, regarding Ukraine, NATO's options are limited. They may agree on some additional economic sanctions, but NATO is not going to have any direct military response to the Russian moves in Ukraine. Ukraine, of course, is not a member of NATO. And this is sort of the red line that NATO has drawn, saying you cannot invade any of our members, including the ones in the East, or we will respond. But the other side of that coin is that if you invade other countries that are not our members, we won't respond militarily. They're providing various kinds of assistance to Ukraine. They may step that up as well, as well as uh, diplomatic pressure and, as I said, economic pressure. But that is pretty much how they're going to deal with Ukraine. Now, finally, just before oh it appears as though we lost our person there well thank you very much he was talking to about us about the is threat as well as the nato summit which is taking place in wales tomorrow well now lesotho's prime minister thomas Debani has returned home after fleeing the mountain kingdom to neighboring south africa on saturday at the time he said the military had staged a coup and that's a charge which they denied Regional leaders rejected his call for troops to be deployed to restore order. The unrest is thought to be linked to a struggle between Mr. Tabani, reportedly support, supported by the police, and the deputy prime minister, and he, they're said to have been loyal to the army. Mr. Tabani has headed a unity government since elections in May 2012, but suspended parliament sessions in June to avoid a vote of no confidence amid feuding in his coalition. 
Lesotho, which is surrounded by South Africa, has experienced several coups since independence in 1966. Now, Somalia's government has offered an amnesty to fighters of Islamist group Al-Shabaab amid uncertainty over whether its leader survived a U.S. airstrike. The statement also says that the militants would be reintegrated into society if they surrendered over the next 45 days. The offer seems to be an attempt to exploit the vulnerability of Al-Shabaab following the airstrike. Al-Shabaab has refused to say whether its leader, Ahmed Abdi Gudain, survived and the strike took place on Monday as he was traveling in a convoy in southern Somalia's lower Shabal region. Well, it's a very unfortunate and sad incident, but the British Deputy High Commissioner in Lagos has died after a suspected heart attack in the airport today. Doctors treated him at the international airport, but unfortunately were unable to save him. Peter Carter, who was 57, had just arrived in Lagos Murtala Mohammed International Airport from Houston, Texas, when he collapsed. The British High Commission in Lagos 